Brian Winhorst, ESPN senior NBA writer, kind enough to join us. We have All-Star Weekend festivities. Let me ask you about a couple of things here. The uh, Russell Westbrook situation of who wants him or does anybody want him and uh, the contract status that he would bring with him. Well, clearly we have a number of players who have already executed buyouts and are already playing with their new teams. So if somebody wanted him, he'd be on a roster. Now, I would just say that it's February, whatever, it's mid-February. We have a long time between now and when uh, the deadline would be to be added to a roster. So he has time. There there could be an injury somewhere else. But, um, you know, typically in a buyout situation, you're looking for a guy to plug a role, to fill a limited role in most cases. And that's not been the MO that Westbrook has portrayed. I, I do think he'll play in the NBA again. But it's just not that simple. So um, I don't exactly know why the Jazz haven't bought him out. I suspect it's because he doesn't want to sit out there on the market without a job. Uh, But it's really a simple negotiation. They'll reduce his salary by what he could sign for, and he moves on with his life. It's it's not it's not it's not the Jazz choice at this point. I believe it's Russell's. What about Kevin Love's situation? This one is a little bit more complicated, especially for a guy who's been in a place almost a decade, won a title there. Um, you don't see guys like this get bought out. Number one, guys who are still, you know, players who can contribute to a playoff team. You just don't see it. Secondly, the Cavs let him go and just let him go wherever he wants. Like Miami is one of the teams that could could get him, Dan. And, and Miami has actually had a lot of success against Cleveland this year. And that could be a first round of, uh, series. The last thing you want if you're the Cavs is to have Kevin Love. You're paying him $30 million, by the way, this year. He comes in and hits two three-pointers in game four against you. It's not a good look. So there might be some negotiation on where he goes there. But it's an interesting situation because this is a guy who has a long history with that organization, has gone through thick and thin, has been on the trade block a dozen times, and they've kept him. And now it's going to end quietly because basically the Cavs – don't need him right now. They've um, they haven't played him for the last twelve games, and they've looked really good during it. And so I think he went to the team and was like, "Is there any chance you're going to play me anytime soon?" I'm like, well, no, but maybe there'll be an injury or something, and he he wanted out. So it was a situation to monitor. But I'm still kind of surprised that after all of this, that Kevin Love is going to end his time with the Cavs. Probably a guy who deserves his number retired there. To be honest with you, in a sort of middle of the night buyout during All Star break. What about the Lakers? reuniting with LeBron? Could you see Kevin fit into whatever they're doing? I think the Lakers are definitely kicking the tires there and looking. Uh, I don't think it's the best fit for him. I think uh, I I, certainly Miami would be a good fit because they need size and shooting. I don't know if the Cavs are going to allow that as part of the buyout. That's part of what I think that's under discussion. The team that I think is more, it might be more interesting is Phoenix Um, because James Jones uh, was Kevin's teammate. They have a good relationship. They have an open roster spot. But I watched the Suns play last night. They played against the Clippers, and Monty Williams played like 11 or 12 players, and after the game said, I can't even play this many, and that's before Kevin Durant comes back. So I wonder if there's even room. I mean, there's room on the roster, but I wonder if there's room to play him. So um, he may take a little bit of time, um, but the LeBron thing is interesting. You know, it's kind of funny, Dan. LeBron played in Cleveland a few weeks, uh, I don't know, it was like over a month ago. And before the game, he was all hugs with Kevin. Uh, Kevin got married last summer. LeBron was at his wedding. There's great affinity there, even though they had a, you know, up and down time as teammates. And it was just like, they were best of friends. And then the game started and LeBron <laughs> relentlessly attacked him on the court. Just, just, just. Went for his throat on defense. <laughs> yeah. And the Cavs had to pull him out of the game. And that is actually kind of the reason why they just had to stop playing him because he's not shooting well enough anymore to justify him, his defense. And so, like, I'm sure LeBron wants him. But at the same time, LeBron knows what Kevin Love is at this point in his career. You've covered LeBron since he was in high school. And here he is, the all-time leading scorer. It, it's rare when somebody – uh moves past all of the hype around them. And I don't know of another athlete who had more hype going into being a professional than LeBron did. How would you capsulize this of LeBron from high school to LeBron, the all-time leading scorer? Well, being there last week, 
was it last week? It feels long ago. Being there last week, I had, I'll, I'll take two things away from that night. One, um, he brought everybody from his life into that game. Um, I know enough to never predict. Uh, I know enough to be able to say, I don't know what's going to happen in the NBA. Having said that, I would have gambled on LeBron making the 36 points that night because everybody was there. And so to see all of those people from his really before he was even a teenager, you know, he had the family of Frankie and Pam Walker who took him in when he was fifth grade. LeBron missed 100 days of school as a fourth grader. Fifth grade had perfect attendance, completely changed his life. The discipline, the punctuality, you want to piss LeBron off, be late to something. All of that came from that family, and they were there. Just as important it was, was to have his mother there, just as important as it was to have his family there. So that seeing all those people there for the total circle journey from when he started to, to, to then, because even going back to his first game as a pro, he was petrified and kind of alone. It was out in Sacramento. It, it, it was sort of a, a weird feeling. He wasn't. He didn't feel great with that team. That wasn't the memory. The memory was more even before that. The second thing is, in the post-game locker room with him and his his two sons, particularly uh, Bronny, I mean, I remember when Bronny would come into, he didn't come in a lot, but he would come into locker rooms when LeBron was in Cleveland and he would go around to the the ice buckets where guys used to, uh, you know, they still do, you know, ice their feet. And he would pick the ice up and start throwing it across the room. And LeBron would be over there putting on his suit back when guys wore suits. And he'd be tightening his tie and he'd scream over at him, Bronny, Bronny, <laughs> you know, he would like, you know, you know, scold him. And now here they are, uh, you know, he's really probably two years away from being in the NBA. He's having a spectacular senior season. Uh, six months ago, I wouldn't have said I thought he was for sure going to be an NBA player. I now feel like he will be. Okay. And so that circle, again, of just is a reminder of how long this journey has been is that he used to scold this kid to not play around, and now he practically could put on a uniform and fit in that locker room. We're talking to Brian Windhorst of the Mothership, senior NBA writer. I'm still trying to figure out this Anthony Davis situation with the Lakers because it 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 feels uneven. Like, there's something there. And go back to the night that he broke the scoring record where I think Anthony Davis was sitting down and said, hey, we were losing, and I was frustrated. And my thought is... Well, you've been losing all season long, so that wasn't something new to you in that moment. So what am, what am I missing with Anthony Davis here? I don't – that explanation was hard to accept in that moment. Um, I don't care if you were 0 and, 0 and 40. That's a celebration of 20 years of your teammate. And even if you were annoyed about something, even if you were annoyed at LeBron, you certainly wouldn't back that way. So that was a very strange thing. I can't explain that. Um I do think that, you know, Patrick Beverly came out after he was traded and then released and indicated that there was something else besides the basketball that was causing problems with the Lakers. My response to that was, well, it was also the basketball because they are, they are very poorly uh, you know, a put together team before the trades. Um, but it does lead you to wonder what's going on there. I wish I could say, oh, yeah, Dan, I know exactly what it is. And it's these three things. Um I do think that there's something amiss there, but I also think that NBA seasons are very long and very restorative. And so they've got 22, 23 games left. I know they're in 13th place. It's actually kind of laughable that we spend as much time as we do talking about a team in 13th place. But at the same time, I also can't look at you and say it's impossible that they couldn't squeeze in to the main playoffs. I think they'll probably end up in the play-in. And so while I admit that there might be something amiss there, I don't think Anthony Davis wants to not be a Laker. I My understanding is he's still 100% bought into that. And whatever issues there are, there is still time to salvage something out of this season. And so I think those are two things to keep in mind as we try to figure that out. You know, Brian, you uh, answered your own question. It's the Lakers, just like we covered the Cowboys. Like, your network loves the cow. How can we get the Cowboys into every single show? How do we get the I, I I've been there in those rundown meetings where they go, uh, hey, can we can we work this into the show? And almost ever on a daily basis there. So that's always going to be the fascination. Wherever LeBron goes, he's going to be in the in the mix, and the Cowboys are always going to be in the mix. Yeah, just know that I fight the good fight in okay. the production meetings, and I and I bring up, you know, hey. You know, the Timberwolves have been playing pretty good recently. And I go, yeah, about the yeah. – well, I can't figure How's out – How's LeBron done you know, against the Timberwolves? Let's look at his stats right. against the Timberwolves. 
what, what I'm always amazed by is that like we do, we like do Lakers coverage at, you know, seven and eight in the morning Eastern. I'm like that. All their fans are still asleep. <laughs> uh, Kevin Durant now with another team, he's 34. I, I'm just wondering if, how is history going to treat Kevin Durant when it's all said and done? Yeah, I mean, you'd actually be a really good person to say that because your perspective over the long haul, uh, your voice, you know, contributes to that. Um, I am somebody who has inc- in- incredible admiration for Durant's uh, abilities and and the way he's recovered from injuries. And I will always appreciate what Durant did at the 2020 Olympics, Rex Weir, and played in 2021. He's coming off an Achilles injury, really probably should not have been, should not have been playing. Went over to Tokyo, and I'm telling you, I don't know how many people remember those Olympics because, you know, it was a weird part of the schedule. The NBA season was like had just ended and they were doing the draft and free agency like while they were playing. Durant saved USA's backside. He I mean, Popovich did some moves, um, you know, Drew Holiday and Devin Booker flew over right from the finals. But they were going to lose a couple of those games. And Durant just absolutely carried the U.S. to the gold medal. Um, it is as much of an accomplishment as has happened in, in, uh, you would team USA basketball in the history of the program. I don't think he just gets the proper credit for it. And I also am a very big believer that the warriors don't win those two, those two finals without him, the 2017 Cavs team, the, the first one that they won, they won that series four one, that 2017 Cavs team was loaded. They were awesome. That was when Kyrie and LeBron were at their peak playing together. The Cavs had made some ad- additions to that team and um, got some three-point shooting. They went 12-1 and one through the East playoffs. Now, I will not defend that the East was exactly that deep that year, but that team was awesome. They don't beat that team without Durant. And the concept to me that Durant was a, you know, a, 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 you know, a riding in the back of the bus to use Charles Barkley's, with all due respect, I just don't think that's true. I think I think Durant was sitting uh, shotgun with uh, Steph Curry, and the, he won. They won the next year. The next year, the, the Kyrie had been traded, and that wasn't the same. But then in 2019, the Warriors lost because Durant got hurt. You know, like I think that case is better if they go up against you know Supreme Kawhi Leonard in 2019, and then they you know, they roll over the Raptors four one. But excuse me, my good friends, <laughs> they lost Durant, and they and they fell apart. They couldn't win. So like. To me, I don't think his legacy needs an iota, but I know that he feels that pressure. And in, and frankly, people keep calling about how it's a it's a it's a tragedy, a basketball tragedy. I got to qualify the basketball tragedy that those Nets never played together. Well, it's a tragedy that Kevin Durant lost, you know, three years of his career and chances other titles, messing around with a guy who wasn't serious about it. You know, Kyrie undercut that team, and then the Harden thing. Harden bears some responsibility. Um, but he, those are three prime years that he could have stayed in Golden State and won some more. And now here he is in his mid thirties, sort of thrashing around again, trying to figure out, you know, a foothold. And that's just not fair to him. That's not, he's a, he, he deserves much better than that. And he made the choice to get it into that, uh, marriage, that basketball marriage with Kyrie. So he has to, to accept that. And that, that was a very risky decision he didn't need to make, but he doesn't deserve the way he's been treated in my opinion. And he's going to end up with, what, 35,000 points maybe when it's all said and done? I'm, I'm guessing. And he could have just stayed in Oklahoma City and probably been in a foot race with LeBron for that record. He, he's chosen to give up the opportunity to score, although the injuries probably would have held him back. What's LeBron going to end up with? 45,000? I mean, yeah. he, well, he's, he's easily going over 40. Uh he wants to play with his son. And I'm telling you, Dan, Bronny is good. Like, I'm not saying he's headed for being an all-star, but his development the last year has been terrific. And but how do they facilitate yeah. this, Brian? That everybody knows LeBron wants to play with Bronny, so our team's going to draft Bronny to keep him from LeBron, or maybe LeBron wants to join another team. Well, that's actually fascinating. I actually think it's gotten more complicated because if you if we'd have had this discussion last summer, I'd have told you, well, he's not going to get drafted, yeah, and so they'll just sign him. They'll just you know just sign him as a free agent, and it won't be a problem. And that maybe even LeBron pulling him out of college after a year might not even be fair to him. But I'm telling you, I don't want to give away like 
our our talent evaluators who who do our mock drafts, specifically Jonathan Gavoni, yeah. I trust him implicitly. This guy's been doing it for 20 years. He is he has told me where he thinks Bronny is going to go in the 2024 draft. And I don't, it's not a guarantee that LeBron's going to be able to get him. So I actually think his improvement has maybe made it more difficult. Wait, do you see a first round play. grade? I'm not going to say, I'm not going to, you know, I know Gavoni is going to come out with it soon, but I'm okay. just saying that like, it's, it's not going to be from what I understand. And from what I, from what I am told by people who try, you know, I don't trust my own eyes. I'm not a basketball talent evaluator. I would say watching him from age 15 to age 18, his physical development has been breathtaking. Of course, that's what every teenager. Um, but I will say this: this was not, this is not going to be a nepotism situation. I don't believe. I think he's going to be. A, you know, I'm not saying he's going to. Again, I'm not saying he's going to be a top three pick. But I think he he's going he's going to earn his way into the NBA on his own well. if he continues developing on this path. Always great to uh, talk to you, Brian. Thank you for making us Have smarter. A great weekend, yeah, man. you too, buddy. That's Brian Windhorst of the Mothership, ESPN senior NBA writer.